we've started it off with um, Steve Fuller um, and Roger Lewis uh, to kind of give a, a background to, to the region as a whole. I think today we're going to kick off and get into some of the actual issues um, that are being worked on by uh, the District of Columbia with respect to um, any number of urban design and land use issues. Uh, it gives me great pleasure to welcome Harriet Dragoning to, to the SCS. Um, Harriet is a very special uh, uh, person, very special voice uh, in the planning community. Um, she has an incredibly interesting background, I think pretty unique in the sense that uh, she has uh, direct uh, significant experience working at multiple levels of government, both in the federal government, at the state government, and municipal government now. Um, and uh, so she certainly has the ability to see all angles on, on many, many different issues. And um, it's also uh, very exciting to uh, uh, have her here. She's uh, very um, generously agreed to serve on the advisory board overlooking the um, the program, and so I hope this won't be the first time we'll, we'll have you here. It'll be many times uh, uh, to come. Um, so uh, thank you, Harriet, and uh, we look forward to your remarks. Thank you. So well, thanks again. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, I got to hear a little bit from Uva about the kind of students that you are, that a lot of you have significant work experience in a lot of different fields. Some of you. Uh, uh, have some pretty deep academic experience and are now looking to get a master's degree. I'm going to cover a lot of topics, but I'm going to leave a lot of time, I hope, for discussion so we can come back to the things that really interest you. So consider this sort of an overview. Uh, the, what I was assigned by Professor uh, uh, Brandis was, uh, was this topic of land use and transportation, but I think it's probably more critical a topic here in our Washington region than anywhere else, and, and I'll tell you why. Uh, we're, um, uh, we're, a, we're a place that is both uniquely blessed with transit resources, um, but we're also a place that is really doubling down on those transit investments. And I'm going to talk about some things that are going on in the region, so you'll get to hear about that. But I think a lot of that has to do with the places like the district and Arlington and Alexandria that have seen some considerable success. Uh, with their transit-oriented development and with all the other things you can do with transportation once you've invested in something like Metro Rail. So um, a, a, an important context is, uh, uh, is, is the population in our region. We're a growing region, uh, but that didn't stop the city from shrinking every single decade since World War II uh, until the decade of uh, between 2000 and 2010. And you can see what that growth curve looks like now for households. Um, so between 2007 and 2012, uh, we added households um, at a rate of 2.2% a year. Now that's a pretty torrid rate of growth, and especially if you contrast it with you know, how we were uh, uh, before that, really pretty much uh, uh, we'd stopped the, the, the heavy, heavy losses in population, uh, but, but we haven't seen growth rates like this since World War II when we had uh, barracks on the National Mall. So it's, it's really a very different picture. But you might ask yourself, why are we growing? You know, what, what, to what do we, do we attribute this, uh, uh, this growth? Um, uh, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a lot of things, but it's mostly transportation, and I'm going to tell you why that's so important. Um, demographically, the District of Columbia looks a lot like the rest of the U.S. will look in 2050. We look like that now. That means a lot more single-person households. It means smaller households. Um, only 20% of our households have school-aged kids. Contrast that with 1960 when that number was closer to 50% of households. So it's very different. We have a lot more older people and empty nesters. There's a, there's a graying of America. Um, so this is a national demographic trend, but we're seeing a lot more of it uh, in, a, in a lot of our cities. Um, what's different, this is, a, this is an important thing, 60% of our growth now is under the age of 35. So that's an unusual statistic in the, 
in the country because, as I said, we're generally getting older, and the average age is, 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 uh, is creeping up in almost every jurisdiction, but not in ours. So who are these people under 35? A lot of it is births. A lot of new birth rates, uh, a lot of new births, a lot of family formation. I'll come back to why that is. But the rest of it is uh, a lot of people like you, highly educated people who are coming here uh, to, to live and to work. Um, we're the most highly educated region of the country, as I think St Steve Fuller probably said when he gave his talk. Uh, the people that are moving here are much more highly educated than the average. So it's beginning to change our economy because, uh, you know, everyone might talk about taxes and the price of rent and land, but the most expensive cost for most businesses that we're talking about, knowledge economy businesses, professional service businesses, it's personnel. 80% of the cost is personnel. And if the best and the brightest are here in the city, it's a very different value proposition now about whether it makes sense to be here or not. Um, so why are all these people under 35 with all these college degrees, why are they moving to the district? Part of it has to do with uh, our development pattern. Um, you know, we're a landlocked city. We have a famous uh, plan laid out by Pierre L'Enfant, but we have a, a, even in our, what we would call our streetcar suburbs, we have a pattern of development that's very convenient, very neighborhood oriented, very easy to serve by transit. 96% of households are within a quarter mile of transit in the district. Um, and, and that makes a huge difference. And one of the big efforts in planning has been to focus on neighborhoods and make sure that we had convenient destinations, shopping destinations, service destinations, and walking distance. So now there are dozens of neighborhoods in the district, uh, very different than even 10 years ago, where it's, it's extremely convenient to live. You have transit amenities, but you can also walk to meet a lot of your daily needs. Because what is attractive about the district that I think is the single biggest factor drawing people to the city is the luxury of transportation choice. Um, how many of you have what you might call crushing college debt? Raise your hands. All right, well, we are the, actually the number one uh, concentration, the highest concentration of college debt in the entire country. And our average indebtedness is in the 40,000s of dollars per indebted person. The national average is in the low 20s. And yet we have the second lowest default rate in the country because people know they can live here, they can live here without a car, and they can pay off their student loans much more rapidly. We're fortunate to be in an economy that's growing, in a city that is adding jobs every year. Uh, but, but part of the reason you can live here without a car, it's not just metro. It's that we have all kinds of transit and all kinds of choices. Uh, and, and some of the most interesting things have been what I would call the, uh, the software that goes with our hardware. So we now have technologies and apps that can tell you when the next bus is arriving. H how to choose among five or six different transportation choices about what will get you there least expensively or most quickly or with the fewest connections. So there's lots of ways that people can uh, find transportation to be very convenient. As opposed to the old days when you would watch the X2 bus go by and go, hmm, I wonder where that's going from and to and if it makes any sense for me to get on it. So now that whole transportation landscape is much more legible and there are a lot more options. Um, and I give a lot of credit to, uh, to the millennial generation who seems to be determined to have a very high quality of life and yet spend only a fraction of what their parents have spent to get something very similar. So the automobile is a great case in point. Uh, the automobile is driven 5% of the time and parked, depreciating somewhere, 95% um, of the time. And that's not a value proposition that's appealing to a lot of millennials, especially if they can have the convenience of driving anytime they want to by using Car2Go or Zipcar. Um, companies like Daimler, who's behind Car2Go, and like BMW, are very much getting into use models of transportation, not ownership models. And that's really, uh, you know, that's really a big opportunity area because cars are expensive and like I say, they're an asset that, that people don't use very often. Um, so this has led to some interesting things in the district. At this point in time, according to the census, 82.4% of households in the district are car light. By that I mean they have one or fewer cars. 38.5% of all households in the district don't have any car at all. So that means our planning, our regulations, you know, how we're looking at the future 
has to be very different than the zoning and, and planning that we did in 1950 uh, to figure out how we were going to serve the city that we thought we were going to be. So in fact, we are in the process right now of revising our zoning code for the first time since 1958 because it was planning for a, a city where everybody drove. Everybody had a car and that was how you got around. Well, that's not the city we are now and it's certainly not the city that we're becoming. So the sharing economy works not just in transportation but in a lot of other things. How many of you have ever used Airbnb? Yep. So. Uh, I often have to explain to people in a room what that is because, again, the sharing economy is a lot more native to millennials who have figured out all kinds of clever ways to have great experiences and get great services and not pay the same amount as other people do. So um, Airbnb now has more rooms available. At any given day in the District of Columbia, there's somewhere between 15 and 1,800 Airbnb rooms available. Uh, the largest bricks and mortar hotel chain in the world, and it took 60 years for, him, for that hotel chain to become the largest, uh, was eclipsed by Airbnb in four years. So, you know, this is something that's important um, because cities, um, cities are, are places where uh, lots of creative, uh, creative things happen, but we're also cities where, uh, where, where a lot of assets get concentrated. And part of this whole thing around the sharing economy is figuring out ways to use our assets much more intensely than we've used them before. Imagine a city where instead of driving your car 5% of the time, cars got shared and got driven 50% of the time. What would happen? Half the parking would disappear. Hmm. If half the parking disappeared, we could maybe put dedicated transit lanes on a lot of our major corridors. That would make it even easier for people to take transit. Um, we wouldn't need to build so much parking. Park, a structured parking space can add forty to $70,000 to the cost of a housing unit. So we'd have a little more affordable housing. Um, so anyway, you kind of see where I'm going, that these are big, Teutonic kinds of changes that are happening in cities, and probably nowhere as rapidly as here. So you know what my favorite transit system is in the district? Bike share. It's a real transit. I mean, people didn't think of it that way, but it's got that great uh, point to point. You don't have to plan a round trip, you know? You know any, at any moment, you can walk out the door and have no idea how you're going to get where you're going. As long as you have a smartphone, you can figure it out as you go. You could figure it out. You could see, is a bike share available? Is there a car to go nearby? Uh, what's the bus schedule? Is metro running? Uh, you know, is there track work going on? I mean, it's, it's, a, it's an amazingly rich environment for choices. And the sharing economy also means um, uh, that, that there's a lot more uh, resources available to be spent uh, here in our local economy, that there's a lot more creativity happening. And a lot of these things are enabled by new businesses, by new technologies, and there are probably lots of other applications for things that we can share. We just passed the most stringent stormwater requirements in the country, uh, and, and they allow developers to meet half of their requirement to manage stormwater off-site. So you might share your driveway or your rooftop. A developer might put a green roof on it and, and pay you every year uh, to manage the stormwater. You know, those are the kinds of things that are possible. So uh, one of the big investments that we're making, we have great transit. Uh, but we know it's not nearly enough, especially if we want to continue to allow people the flexibility uh, to travel however they might want to travel. So we're investing initially in a 22-mile streetcar system that will become 37 miles, that'll become 50 miles. Um, and we, we, uh, we're doing this uh, in order to create uh, better access to jobs for people who don't have great access. The 96% of people who live within a quarter mile of transit, not all of it is good transit. Some of it uh, doesn't link you directly to job centers. It's not all 10-minute uh, service, right? Uh, it's not what we call premium. So we, we'd like to give people in the district better service. Um, we also know that, that fixed guideway transit, like metro rail systems, like light rail systems, like streetcars, they actually become um, the spine around which development will occur. Development hasn't so far proven to really love bus transportation because the routes can move. But they like, development likes fixed guideway transportation. 
Um, this is something that was in the paper in the last week. 5.5 million square feet of commercial office is under development right now in our region. 4.6 million square feet, 84% uh, is not just near transit, it's within a quarter mile of a metro station. That's how much even office wants to be near transit. Everybody would like to be near transit if they could because it gives them those choices. So we're looking for places to, to lay streetcar routes and we project that with the 37 mile system, we will actually triple the population that's within a quarter mile of a fixed guideway rail system, metro or streetcar. We'll go from 15% of the population to 45% of the population. So it's a big deal. It'll have the same kind of impact on growth in the district that metro had. And you can see some examples of, of how investment loves, how real estate loves transit. We don't even, we're not even running transit yet, not, not streetcar on 8th Street, and 120 businesses have opened in the last four years. I mean, it's pretty amazing uh, what has happened on 8th Street, and that's just the first of many lines that are gonna open. Um, it's part of a major east-west line that's gonna go from Benning Road all the way to Georgetown. It'll go down K Street in a dedicated right-of-way, um, which is the heaviest used transit corridor in the entire region. So it's a great place to try out your first transit line. Um, Noma is another area that, that was, you know, I don't know, how many of you were here 10 years ago? Do you remember what Noma looked like 10 years ago? I mean, it was kind of a collection of vacant lots and warehouses and kind of crummy industrial. And then uh, the red line infill station at New York Avenue went in. Um, and like 10 or 11 years later, it's just not unrecognizable. Um, and, and even in a region like ours, there are not that many places that have great transit access. So that's why the district is explicitly kind of doubling down on its transit investment. Um, and this is important. Uh, when we do streetcar, we're also going to be looking to do uh, much more affordable housing. Right now we have citywide inclusionary zoning, so new development that happens has to provide somewhere between 8 and 10 percent of the housing permanently affordable for as long as the building stands under our inclusionary zoning rules, um, which is great, but as, if, if, if you live in Washington, you know that it's kind of expensive housing and it's not getting cheaper. Uh, we're growing at a rate now of about 1,100 people a month and it's putting a lot of pressure on housing prices. Uh, so it's important that we add a lot more housing. But it's also, you know, I also would like to, to talk about this. What are the two biggest costs uh, in a household budget? Housing is number one, but transportation is right behind it at number two. And depending on where you live in the region, the transportation cost is higher than the housing cost. Ever heard this expression, drive to you qualify? You know, that's about looking for cheap housing where land costs are low, usually on the periphery of the region. But nobody who gives you a loan for that house asks you, how, much, how many times are you filling your gas tank? You know, how much, how much does it cost for you to, to have a car for every person old enough to drive in your family? They don't ask you that. If you're not carrying that car as debt, it doesn't show up in underwriting. Yet, if gasoline goes from $3 to $4 a gallon, it makes a huge difference. So we saw that in the, in the uh, 2008 recession. You know, we're a single job market, a single housing market as a region, but wow, what hugely different results we saw in the region. Enormously different results in terms of changes in property value, foreclosure, uh, bankruptcy. Uh, what we saw in the District of Columbia in 2008 is hundreds of cars dropped off our DMV rolls. Hundreds of them. Because people could dial down their transportation costs and still stay in their jobs, stay in their house, weather those economic storms, not have to go into bankruptcy. Some people did have to sell their house, but they could, right? They could sell because the market was still strong because of all the transit that was around here. So, you know, that's a great thing. And in lots of parts of the region, there was no such flexibility. You know, if you had suddenly insupportable transportation costs, that's your only way to get to anywhere. So it made a huge difference. So we're spending in the district only 9% of income on transportation. That's how low transit helps to make our costs. And, and that low level of car ownership compared to 19%, which is the national average. And in our region, it's as high as 25% in the outer suburbs. So that's a huge difference. 
Uh, I'm going to talk about a couple of other things very quickly. Um, you know, transportation and land use um, are, are incredibly important, but for us, they're also part of a larger uh, plan for the city uh, to, to become the most sustainable city in the U.S. over the next 20 years. Um, this is something that, uh, that, that we're doing across government and in partnership with lots and lots of citizens and uh, institutions and organizations and universities throughout the district. Um, it's a very ambitious, uh, it's a very, very ambitious um, plan, uh, and it, it's, it's not a green plan. Uh, environment is mentioned, but it's really about reshaping the economy. It's really about figuring out how to do things to get that twofer and that threefer, get those multiple benefits from a single investment. Cities used to be wealthy enough and the government uh, provided enough funds that you could be pretty stupid about your investments. You could build a road that was only for cars, that didn't accommodate bikes, didn't do much for pedestrians at all, and you could afford to do that. And maybe build separate facilities for those other uses somewhere else, but no one can afford to do that anymore. Um, so for us, we're looking for strategies that, that make us a more prosperous place, but also make us a fairer place. A less, uh, a less disparate place, a more diverse place, um, and, and we want to do that uh, by, uh, by, by generating uh, a whole new economy around sustainability. I mentioned that we have all of you smart young people moving to Washington with your degrees, which is great. It's really helping the knowledge economy explode here. But that's not the whole economy. And we have, the, we have people who, were, uh, who graduated from DC public schools uh, and even if we are, our most ambitious turnaround plans for the schools are wildly successful, that for decades we're going to have people who don't have college degrees, who need a, a living wage, who need career letter jobs. So we're really looking at sustainability as a way to provide a whole new cadre of jobs around sustainable transportation, around green energy production, around energy efficiency retrofits of all of our building stock throughout the city, around stormwater and green infrastructure. Um, around, uh, around urban agriculture, around uh, a top, you know, waste management that would, uh, that would result in zero waste being produced, everything being reused or repurposed. So all of these jobs would, would not only have local and regional markets, they'd have national and international markets because we have some of the most stringent requirements anywhere in the U.S. So for us, it's a very deliberate strategy to get out ahead on these jobs to get out ahead training our residents for these jobs, helping people start businesses, and really growing that part of the economy. So we have a lot of very ambitious goals, uh, uh, numeric goals, and these are, all by 20, uh, these are all by 2032. So cut uh, greenhouse gases by 50%. Some of these sound ridiculously ambitious, um, but I'll just show you five years of progress on this. this our strategies only came out in 2012 and 2013 uh, but, uh, on sustainability, but when we looked at our baseline that we measured in 2006, by 2011, we had cut our greenhouse gas emissions by 12.7%, okay? But we had grown our economy by 40,000 people and 40,000 jobs, you know? So that was a goal. We were hoping to get, um, you know, by 2020, uh, like a 10% reduction. So to have gotten it in five years, despite all that growth in the economy, was a, was a great jump start for this goal, but we're, we ha still have a long way to go. So you saw some of the early slides. So 50% of our trips right now are walk, bike, and transit. In any city in America, 75% would be a stretch goal, but I don't think it is for us. I think we'll be able to get there fairly easily. So those are the sorts of things that would really give people um, uh, even more choices and even more money to put in their pocket to do other things. Uh, so that means doing at least 37 miles of streetcar by 2032, uh, expanding bike share, uh, expanding car share programs. One of the things that, uh, uh, that, that we care about is not just what we do, but how we do it. Right now, you can't use a car share if you don't have a credit card. You can't use a bike share. So how do we make sure that, that low-income people have access to these kinds of services. So we have programs that we're working on to make that happen. Um, I'm gonna step away from sustainability and talk about the region. So people paid attention during the recession and when they, they saw these very different outcomes. And we haven't always been a region that's worked together. 
but we really have come together around this regional planning initiative called uh, Region Forward. Uh, and, it's, and what's interesting about it is that all 22 local governments that are part of the Metropolitan Washington Council of Governments signed on to this. Even though it has pretty ambitious goals and often uh, you know, numeric metrics that we're going to compare jurisdiction to jurisdiction. One of the biggest differences is that um, we've, we've designated activity centers throughout the region. Now, it looks like a lot of dots. It doesn't look like this is strategic, but let me tell you, um, it is strategic. We went from something like 56 very large activity centers that might have been the better part uh, you know, of a whole county. It might be a, a five mile in radius area, huge areas for planning or development, uh, down to, to, to this, which is 141 areas, quarter mile radius. So all of these can actually be planned, and most of these are currently are planned to be served by transit. So like everybody in the region is kind of getting it, that, that, that through land use and through strategic transit investment, we can really reshape growth patterns in our economy, make our cities and our, our local governments more resilient, make our households more resilient. So if there are hard times ahead, people will be able to weather them much better. Um, and, and we have a, a growing region where the fifth fastest growing region in the country. Um, but, uh, but, you know, for a long time, our, uh, our template was sprawl. We have, you know, places in our region are on the covers of books, right? Uh, the geography of nowhere has Tyson's Corner uh, on the cover, right? But Tyson's is no longer Tyson's Corner. It's Tyson's. It's a new urban place with transit, uh, with, uh, with, with metro specifically, with, uh, uh, you know, with, uh, former parking lots now going to be gridded networks of streets, dense housing and uh, commercial and retail development, and really very, very different places. Same for Rockville, same for White Flint, same for many, many places around the region. And that's because, you know, this is finally being recognized as, uh, as, a, as, as what the market wants to do. So we have more of this urbanizing suburban in our region than any other place. So I hope as part of your studies, you'll get a chance to take a look at some of these places, because that's kind of the challenge for America. I feel pretty confident about what cities are going to be able to do, because they have the good bones. They typically have those gridded networks of streets. They have, they have historic buildings. You know, they have, they have real assets. Um, a lot of our suburban communities don't have those assets, and the, the challenge is retrofitting those places, you know, to make them places that people will want to live in and want to invest in going forward. So we have regional goals through Region Forward around all of these areas, uh, and I'll just talk about a couple of them. Uh, accessibility, uh, you know, really maximizing connectivity and walkability. I sit on our regional transportation planning board. And, you know, and one of the things we're explicitly doing is taking the goals in region forward and then putting them into the transportation context so that we can make investments in the region consistent with achieving those, these goals and not undermining them. Um, so very similar goals on climate and sustainability uh, for the entire region. Um, I mentioned that our activity centers are, we have more of them, but they're smaller. And you can see kind of what they look like. Um, they're, they're, they're both traditional urban centers. Uh, in some cases, they're new towns. Um, the, the one on the lower uh, right is, the, is Columbia Heights, um, you know, kind of a transit hub that, uh, that also has been transformed in the last 12 years. Uh, in some cases, they're traditional towns, you know, Leesburg, right? Excellent little town surrounded by sprawl. We'll see what they can do. Um, so these activity centers are now where we're really focusing investment, including looking at very innovative ways to measure the quality of the built environment. Um, so we're doing some things here that nowhere, no one else in the country is doing, and I'll talk to Uva about maybe some other speakers you might be able to have to take a look at this, because it might be really cool for you guys to be trained in how to use these tools uh, that involve a physical survey of a given place. It might be interesting just to go through the process. Uh, but they end up being really important tools that can guide private investment, public investment, community investment. It's a, it's a pretty interesting process, and so much research has been done here that we, that we have the ability to do this, and I don't think it is being done anywhere else. So uh, we're, we're calling these different types of uh, urbanizing suburban um, 
uh, you know, uh, walk-ups, basically. And we have six types in our region. Uh, as I said, 77% have or are adding uh, uh, rail transit. Uh, and I think that that number is going to grow because the market, as I said, really wants to be there. Tyson's. Have you been to Mo the Mosaic District in Maryfield? That's another entirely new development that's built around uh, 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 proximate to transit and, uh, and, and, and wanting to be one of these, uh, uh, these, these new activity centers. Um, I mentioned this, uh, this earlier uh, about how much office wants to be there. This is another interesting statistic, that 28% of all the region's real estate value um, is within a quarter mile of metro, uh, half a mile of metro right now on only 4% of the land. It's those kinds of fundamentals that are really making a difference in our region. So I'm going to stop here, and then we can talk about any of the things I mentioned or anything else you'd like to, to have a conversation about. It's much smaller, so we had more than 100 miles uh, in the old streetcar network, but in many ways, our major transit corridors are the same corridors that, uh, that, that you know, for 120 years, you know, so, so in some ways, they're, they're no-brainers where some of them are going to go. In, in other ways, uh, they, they, are, they are new routes. Um, so uh, for the first, uh, you know, we don't really have anything that goes like the, this, this initial line is going to go from Benning Road to Georgetown, even though it goes through sections that are very heavily traveled with transit. Uh, but a lot of things are going to be what you'd expect. We could probably afford to and support uh, north-south lines that are on 14th Street on Georgia Avenue uh, and maybe one other north-south street like 16th. You know, they're all, and they're all very heavy and traditional transit corridors. Connecticut, Massachusetts, Wisconsin, those are all streetcar old, you know, streetcar suburbs. I mean, right, Chevy Chase Land Company was a, you know, streetcar, comp a, a, a real estate development company that, that invested in streetcars only as a way to get people to their real estate, right? That was how those, you know, almost every streetcar a uh, hundred years ago uh, began as a, a speculative real estate. So, you know, we, we grew up uh, around that, that pattern of development in our region and in many other places. Um, so we'll we'll see a lot of uh, a lot of the routes being very similar, just not yet as much. Yeah. So um, I'll be really candid with you. So we're, you're in a place that's kind of a newbie place, right? We have a, you know, we're an old city. We're kind of a new local government. So we've had home rule since 1973, right? Not that long. And for, and for most of that history, as I told you, until the last 10 years, we were a city in